everyone. We'd like to begin uh, this community forum and dialogue today on uh, high stakes testing as well as uh, curriculum standardization. Uh, my name is Ricardo Rosa. I am a uh, professor at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. I'm a professor of education, leadership, and policy studies. Uh, I do have some viewpoints in the matter, but the viewpoints obviously you know, don't reflect my university. But these are my personal viewpoints, so I always make sure to put that out there. I am a board member of Save Our Schools, the national organization. I'm a board member of, uh, I'm a co-director of the Southeast Massachusetts and Rhode Island Coalition to Save Our Schools, as well as a board member of the organization called Third Eye here in the I'd like to first of all begin by thanking a few people uh, for making this possible. First of all, my wife, Benny, uh, who helped uh, to put together a great deal for participants in this conference. I'd like to thank the National Parks because uh, you know this is a public space. And they uh, always open up their home for public dialogue. Uh, especially in an era when uh, so much public space is being erased and these dialogues are not happening. I think this is critical you know, for a democratic society. So I'd like to thank National Parks for, for allowing us to be here. I'd like to thank uh, my department um, and the leadership of uh, João Parashkeva for also helping uh, put this event together. And my partner, Jose Solera, who's the co-chair. Jose, where are you? Co-chair of the Southeast Massachusetts Rhode Island Coalition to Save Our Schools, uh, students in the Department of Educational Leadership, and colleagues from UMass. Where are you? Colleagues, professors. That's good. So nice to see uh, folks um, who are academics are uh, not standing on the balcony. I really appreciate that. Coming out to support um, public projects like this. I really appreciate that. Uh, any parents in the room? Parents? Oh, you look at that. I hear you. And teachers, teachers in the room? All right. I always hear I, um, the last um, last comment about uh, sort of this whole high stakes testing and whether or not teachers should be making some noise in their schools and so forth and so on. You know, somebody mentioned that teachers are kind of, you know caught between a rock and a hard place. Administrators are caught in the same position. And I'm thinking about it, I'm like, wow, you know, a lot of atrocities you know, have been created in the world because people are just doing their jobs, you know? Um, now, that's not to say that, uh, you know, you should sort of create a stir that, that, that uh, will, will get you fired, uh, but certainly, uh, I don't think any of us uh, should be standing still in light of what's happening in current in this particular reform. Um, any uh, administrators in the room? Administrators? <laughs> So we're dealing with a whole lot today. We're dealing with a lot of acronyms, right? NCAS, uh, Common Core, right? Uh, CCSS. Uh, we're dealing with uh, the park, you know? And when I think about all of these acronyms and what you're doing to our public educational system right now, I think about another acronym, one that's very common in social media, WTF. You know, I mean, it's horrific what's going on, and these panelists here uh, can really speak uh, to the structures before us today. So I'm going to step to the side and just let them take over. But before I do so, let me just introduce the panelists. Uh, first, we have uh, Monty Neal, who is uh, Dr. Monty Neal, who's the executive director of an organization called Fair Test, the National Center for Fair and Open Testing and chair of the National Forum on Educational Accountability. He has initiated national and state coalitions of education, civil rights, religious, disability, parent, and other organizations to work toward fundamental change in student assessment and school accountability. His many publications address problems with testing, benefits of high quality assessment, and resistance to high stakes testing. Fair, uh, Fair Test website is uh, www.fairtest.org. Alan Jalen is a former education writer, most recently with uh, NEA Today, the magazine of the National Education Association. He's a board member of Citizens for Public Schools, a co-author of the 2013 CPS report on the results of 20 years of education reform in Massachusetts. 
Barbara Mataloni, who will join us shortly, uh, she's running a little bit late today, she's coming in from Hyannis, is running for president of the Massachusetts Teachers Association. Barbara and Educators for Democratic Union are organizing to build a union that is democratic and transparent, consults members and local leaders, stands up for education workers and for, uh, for high quality public education, acts on a vision of public education as a cornerstone of democracy, strengthens ties with parents, students, and communities. Uh, former Mayor Scott Lane served as the 37th mayor of the city of New Bedford from his inauguration on January 2nd, 2006 until January 2nd, 2012. After serving three terms in office, Mayor Lane did not seek a fourth ter term. On January 3rd, 2012, he returned to his New Bedford law office, Lang, Sifaras, and Buller, which is entering its 30th year. For more information about uh, Scott Lang, and he's written extensively on this particular issue, on high stakes te testing especially, uh, you may visit scottwlang.com. Seresta Smith is National Action Coordinator for Save Our Schools, one of my sheroes here. Sylvester Smith is a 25-year 25, 25 veteran educator who has taught grades 6 through 12 reading, language arts, and beginning and advanced television production. She earned her national board certification in adult, young adult English language arts in 2002 and now serves as a teacher, leader, and mentor in the state of Florida. In September of 2008, she moved from a school deemed high performing to serve as a teacher, leader, and literary coach in a school deemed low performing. While there, she became a 2009-2010 recipient of, Jordan, of a Jordan Fundamental Grant that facilitated the implementation of Titans, a literacy building initiative designed by her and funded by basketball great Michael Jordan's philanthropic nonprofit that honors teachers who motivate and inspire students toward achieving excellence. As a committed educator and activist, Ms. Smith founded the uh, Concerned Teacher Coalition in 2009 to address the inequities in Miami-Dade County's predominantly African-American public schools. This led, her, this led to her involvement in the effort to end the implementation of market-based reforms that serve to dismantle public education. One of the original organizers of Save Our Schools March and National Call to Action and a sought-after public speaker she continues to champion for public education in her roles of steering committee member of Save Our Schools and administrator for United, United Opt Out National, an organization that serves to end punitive high stakes testing and the market based reforms that are integral to privatizing education. Ruth Rodriguez Fay holds a BA in social work and did graduate studies in bilingual education at Boston University. She was a community fellow in the Urban Studies Department. At MIT, where she researched school violence. She has spent most of her career in the field of education as a kindergarten teacher, school family, and community coordinator, and supporter of parent teacher collaboration. Ruth is a member of the National Save Our Schools Theory Committee and sits on the advisory board of Citizens for Public Schools in Boston, Massachusetts. Ruth served as a Massachusetts governor of Deval Patrick's Readiness on Deval Patrick's Readiness Project on MCAS an assessment, an initiative that brought together a diverse group of educators to advise the governor on the Massachusetts Comprehensive uh, Assessment System. Uh, that would be the Massachusetts High Stakes Exam for promotion and graduation requirement. So let's give him a hand. <laughs> One more person to the panel, Dr. Jean Rosa, who is the Executive Director of the Cape Verde Studies Center at Bridgewater State University also a longtime teacher at Rockville Public High School and a former teacher educator at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're going to begin with former Mayor Scott Lang because I know that former Mayor Scott Lang has a, another event in Boston. So we'll begin there and we'll <coughs> I know that uh, a lot of our 
to you. And uh, I want to tell you that I see this is being recorded, and I'm going to uh, watch every minute of this. I, as uh, Professor Rosa said, I, I have to uh, get on the road, but I'm certainly very interested in hearing what everyone has to say, and I know I'll learn a lot about it uh, in watching. So let me explain to you how this uh, fits in from my perspective. Now, my perspective is as a, uh, a parent uh, of kids who now have uh, uh, made, begun to make their own life. Uh, my perspective as a citizen of uh, the city of New Bedford, someone who's been here in, since my young adult life uh, through today, and certainly not going to be uh, continuing for uh, uh, the millennium and beyond. Uh, the, my gut feeling on this is, is that uh, uh, you also want to hear how I feel about this as a public servant, as an elected official, and as head, the uh, de facto head of the school committee. And I am going to uh, lay it all out for you in those terms. First thing that I want to tell you is that uh, the key issue here, from my perspective, is not assessment testing. I think everyone uh, would agree that assessment testing is important. If it has the right purposes, it's extremely important. We were all tested at one point or another when we were in school, or still are in school. So whether that was a test that was administered by your teacher, or a test that was administered by the school district, maybe an Iowa test, or, uh, or one of the versions of uh, national tests. It was designed to see how we are doing, and it was designed to hopefully craft an improvement plan for us on an individual basis to do better. Uh, it was not designed to uh, see how we're doing and then uh, indict uh, the teacher that was uh, teaching us. It might be used, certainly, to uh, improve the teacher's skills, but it certainly was not to be uh, the, the uh, pivotal uh, measure of whether a teacher was doing a good job or not. And it was not to be that way back in 1993 when uh, mass education was first, was first passed. Uh, it was to be used as a tool. Now, the interesting thing about this is that we evolved so far that we have a system now that requires it to go to public school. They can pass a standardized test in order to validate, and I'm using the word that was uh, given to me by one of the education commissioners when I was mayor, but validate the high school diploma. So immediately what that says is that when you're questioning whether or not your high school diploma was given to you appropriately, in other words, did you really pass the test? Did you really reach the point that you, uh, that you were able to uh, indicate that you <coughs> met education requirements, uh, I'm sorry, had attendance requirements, and the education requirement, and at the same time uh, was able to uh, uh, perform under a uh, certified program of licensed teachers. Uh, so that test was designed to back check what the teachers have done. Now the interesting thing is it wasn't only back checking what teachers have done in the 10th, 11th, 12th grade, the 9th grade, the 8th, the 7th, but it went back in essence when Mrs. Doherty in first grade taught me how to uh, read and gave me my first book. It went back to my fourth grade uh, book report, in which I gave a book report and the teacher gave me a C plus or a C minus, said C me, whatever it might be. But the interesting thing was that it needed to validate uh, the work of teachers, which to me seemed to be something that absolutely was uh, foolhardy and uh, would lead to a tremendous amount of problems. And I spoke about that in my first uh, State of the City address back in 2006, when we began at that point to require passing math and English uh, MCAS in order to get your high school degree. And what happened to me was very, very simple. I was meeting with uh, uh, different school administrators and going through the high school graduation ceremony, and they uh, looked at an impressive list of 600 some odd kids, and then there was about six, I think 38 actually kids on the list that said they were receiving certificates of attendance. And I said, uh, certificates of attendance. Now that is in addition to their high school diploma. And they said, no. And what happened was they did not pass one or both of their MCAS tests, so therefore they don't get a high school diploma. They get a certificate of attendance. Now at the time, a certificate of attendance was the equivalent of patting someone on the back and saying, thanks for coming out for 13 years. Thanks for watching the class in the third grade when your uh, classmate was sick and I asked you to watch the class while I took him or her down to the nurse. 
Thanks for singing in the school choir. Thank you for playing on whatever team it might have been or being on the debate club. But since you didn't pass a bubble test, you're not getting your high school degree. Here's your certificate of attendance. And at that time, I said, this, this absolutely is not right and won't work. But let me just make sure I understand this now. We're requiring this year uh, that you have to pass uh, both MCAS tests. All right, let me, before I speak out on it, let me uh, see what the MCAT test is all about. Because if an MCAS test is something that is pro forma, then certainly I don't want to uh, say anything that would, uh, that would be inappropriate. So I got two copies, one copy of English, one copy of, of the math uh, MCAS test. And I sat down, and I, the English test I looked at and said, okay, this, this is manageable. This has got every, every little bit of meat and potatoes. I know this is reasonable for me, for, a, for an English-speaking uh, uh, person. Uh, it's not reasonable if they gave it to me in Spanish, even though I took four years of Spanish in high school and four semesters of Spanish in college, homo se llama, uh, you know, uh, que tal, uh, a si a si is about all that I have, have uh, retained. So if you gave it to me in Spanish as a second language for me, I know that's not a test that I would do very well at. But as far as the English speaking individual, uh, let's go with the English test. The math test I found very interesting. Now, I have a degree, I have, I, have a, I, have to say, I have a New York State Regents Diploma. So I went through, in essence, uh, not standardized testing, but an elevated test, allegedly, uh, back in the, uh, in the 60s, that, that uh, in essence, allowed me to achieve a little higher, uh, in essence, uh, uh, degree than if you just got a, a high school diploma. I got a Regents Diploma, so I feel pretty confident that I did okay in high school, not, you know, great, but okay. I got a, a degree from the university, and worked hard, you know, like all of us do, and did well, but I got a degree from the university, uh, Marquette, and then I got a law degree uh, from Georgetown, worked a little bit harder, but I feel pretty comfortable that, you know, I'm, by, when I ran for mayor, I campaigned on, I'm not a genius, I'll prove that to you, and if, you, uh, if you're not going to help, don't vote for me. So I proved many times to the city that I was an genius and continue to do that today. But the fact was, when I opened the math book, feeling very confident, I got through the first two or three pages, sailing through saying, I don't know that I should think about this standardized validation, because this looks to me like people should be able to handle this. I'm not quite sure what the, what the story is. I got to page four of the MCAS test and realized in math that I'm not getting my high school diploma. I am also now obligated to turn back in my law degree from Georgetown, my BA from Marquette, my Regents Diploma from New York because I can't pass this test. And the fact of the matter is, when I thought about it, uh, to what end? For what purpose? Why would I possibly require uh, a high school diploma be validated when I've got teachers that are licensed in a, in a accredited curriculum that I know that they've met their attendance requirements and passed their grades? for 13 years. So it didn't hit well with me. The problem also, though, was that when I found out very quickly that parochial schools and private schools don't take an MCAS, can't spell an MCAS, it, it made me extremely, extremely uh, upset about the idea that people, in essence, were opting out back then for their kids by sending to them anything but a public school. Public school, you had to pass the test, take it, start taking it in fourth grade, take it up through junior high, take it and start in 10th. In parochial and private schools, you don't. You get a high school diploma in, in a parochial or private school without it being, and I, I never do this, validated. So I, re I realized that it was not an equitable system. It was a separate system, completely inequitable, and something needed to be said about it. And I know other people were talking about it uh, before I was, but I am always happy to come and speak to it. And the more that I, I handle it, the more that I see it, the more that I realize that this is going to be an issue, meaning education reform, the in industrialization of the education system that is going to cost us our democracy. And the reason is because we're not educating the people in our society that we need to educate every single day. We need to stand up for them and educate them. And that's the kids who fall below the poverty line. That's the kids who English is a second language. That's the kids who have special ed issues. 
We are not educating them. We are not educating them because we're focused on trying to teach them how to take a bubble test. In, in many cases, in a language that they're not familiar with. In many cases, when they don't have whatever, whatever, the, whatever the reason is, they don't have the ability to pass a bubble test, but they can soar in our society if they're let in. The, kid, the kids that sat in front of me and back of me, that got high school diplomas when I were a kid, I call now for contributions to worthy causes. I call now to say, can you hire so-and-so, give him or her a break and get him a job. The idea that you are being defined when you're going to high school for the rest of your life because you couldn't pass a bubble test is, is a tremendous credit to us, good for us. It's going to come back and hurt us like you never thought of before. The idea that we're washing out legions of teachers, great teachers, because a percentage of the people in a school or the percentage of the people in their class, which is perfectly understandable because it's a nationwide trend, are unable to excel or pass the bubble test is a major problem for us. We are losing some of our more skilled teachers because they realize the nonsense of it. We are losing kids as dropouts day by day because they don't want to sit in a teach to the test drill. They don't want to be in a situation where they are literally being going, going to be defined by a number, where they won't have the tools to contribute to our society, they won't have been fully taught, they won't be able to, in essence, exercise their normal judgment, normal skills day in and day out, because we never bother to do it. If Magellan's not a computer program or a test, they won't know what it is or who he is. The fact is we're washing away a couple of generations of kids while we're involved in this education reform movement. Now I'm going to tell you what the real interesting thing about this is, and then I know our panel will fill in everything. And, I, and I'm going to, I'm going to uh, take one minute and a second just to look at uh, some notes to make sure that I, that I haven't left anything out. But let me explain to you how this works. When I started banging this, and I mean hitting this as hard as I could, they did not know, meaning DESE uh, or, or uh, Department of Education at the time, did not know what to call kids who did not pass the MCAS but otherwise earned their degree. I would have called them parochial or private school graduates. They didn't know what to call them. So they sat there very awkwardly for several years. They've now come up with a name for these people, these young people, who I love, who you look in their eyes and realize they're smarter or as smart as we will ever be, who are now being held back because of a bubble test, which again, good for us. I'm going to tell you how this is going to hurt us more than anything in a second. But the fact is, they didn't know what to call them. So about two years ago, three years ago now, I was serving on a task force uh, that the governor put together on economic development. And I jumped on to a number of them, work training, environment, uh, education, because I wanted to just get the full, the full uh, pot party of the issues around the state. And what I realized was there was now a term for kids who did everything that they were supposed to do, but didn't pass one or two of the tests. It's called non-graduating completers. So let's talk about the non-graduating completers. And I guarantee you, if we looked that over, either someone got an award for coming up with that name at DESE, all right, and they rushed that through, or they spent a couple of hundred thousand dollars getting someone to come up with it, right? But the fact is, non-graduating completers in 2013 made up 596 children in the, in the state who were, otherwise would have graduated but are non-graduating completers. You say, well, that's not a very big number out of 75,000 kids. There's also dropouts. There's also kids who go five years. There's also, there's also kids who uh, are unaccounted for. But let's talk about the 596 kids. Those 596 kids, we, we can get our handle around. That's a manageable number. It's gone on now for 10 years. Uh, each year it was more than 596. Uh, I can tell you that because my estimate now is it's up over close to 30,000 kids since this started. But let's do the 596 for a minute. 596, and I don't uh, often agree, or I don't agree with everything that the Pioneer Institute puts out, but I do agree for the sake of this conversation that if you don't graduate from high school, which a non-graduating completer does not graduate from high school, they have the same status as a dropout. But if you don't graduate from high school, in the course of your life, it costs society, meaning everybody, everybody, $350,000. So let's talk about the unfunded liability. All the social consequences of holding people back who normally would have been 
part of our society who would have had that degree. We'll talk about GED in one second also because GED now is an absolute scandal as far as moving the bar, taking a number of people who are starting GEDs who almost have completed, changing the terms this, uh, this year and now telling them they've got to start from scratch. It's ingenious that we want to hold all these people back because it only costs us $350,000 in the course of their life for each one. So it makes an awful lot of sense to not have them out in society working, working with us, being great citizens, doing things that we would absolutely marvel at. It makes a lot of sense as high school kids to hold them back. 350,000 times 596 is 208 million, 208 million dollars. Unfunded liability like that. Bang. Put it on the balance sheet for the, for the Commonwealth. That's if no one serves any time in incarcerated. Then you, can, then you can add, figure out the actuarial table for the individual. That, that particular year, it should have cost 35,000 or 10,000, whatever, add 50 to it, and now you have a new number. And they're much more likely, if they don't have a high school degree, uh, to serve some time in incarceration. Because you've got to be part of society if you're going to be a functioning, productive member of society. We're keeping them out. And who are they? By and large, they're kids below the poverty line, which by and large means many of these children are of uh, minority uh, status, whatever, whatever that means in any community. New Bedford's interesting because our below the poverty line is equal opportunity. We can span all communities. But in many cities, below the poverty line means specific minority groups. Now I want to say just a, a couple of things and then turn it over to the panel. And uh, I expect, you know, this is, this is very encouraging. I talked about this at Fall River two years ago. I think Lou St. John was there at the time. There were uh, 15 people in the room, I think. Today there's uh, 50 people in the room. Next time we talk about this, there'll be a couple of hundred people in the room. Eventually people will realize we're doing this to ourselves. We're washing kids away. We're not teaching individual kids to the best of their, the best absolutely of their ability and opportunity, we are allowing those kids to be left behind. The irony of no child left behind is we're leaving kids behind in legions like we never thought of before. The last thing I want to tell you is that uh, where does this all go as far as, the, as far as the diplomas go? And this is the most bittersweet irony of anything I'm going to tell you. Um, let's, say, let's say that I graduated from New Bedford High with an MCAS degree. I've already told you I wouldn't be able to do that, but let's assume for a minute that I did. And, and uh, uh, this young woman graduated from Stank, and this young man graduated from Tabor. So we all have diplomas. Now, they, their two diplomas are non-MCAS validated diplomas. Mine is an MCAS validated diploma. My school was a licensed teachers and curriculum school. The two other schools that we just talked about, as all parochial and private schools are, have a mix of that. They don't have to meet that same standard. They may be absolutely the best school that we've ever thought of. We all may want to go. They may have areas that they're not as good as the public school, but they don't have the same scrutiny. The great thing about this is we all decide to apply for college. Let's start with the state school, because we have state action here, and someone's going to bring the suit of all suits. But let's say we apply, apply to a state school. The state school doesn't say to the, to the young man who went to Tabor, the young woman who went to Stang, or whatever parochial private school they went to, I'm sorry, but we're going to give preference to the MCAS diploma. The MCAS diploma is, a, is, in a, is in a, labeled as an MCAS diploma. I would think it's assumed it is because I've got a diploma from a public school. But the answer is the MCAS diploma is a high school diploma. The Tabor diploma is a high school diploma. The Stang Diploma is a high school diploma. And there's a good chance they're going to get into the state school before I do. And I pass the MCAS. So the idea that somehow this means something in the long run, this absolutely not only doesn't mean anything in the long run, other than the fact we are cooking ourselves with a major, major problem. We can't afford $208 million a year in unfunded liability. But more importantly, we can't afford to have 596 kids in that particular year who did everything that anyone in this room did, unless you pass an MCAS, sitting out saying, how do I get in society? When am I going to be involved? How can I support a family? Where's the American dream for me? Now, the interesting thing is that many, many of those kids might not be able to do math. Maybe they, maybe they have English as a second language. 
but they are as smart, ingenious, entrepreneurial, and as great as any kid we're graduating. But we wouldn't know it because we don't let them in. The kids who drop out because of MCAS, we have no idea how many. The percentage of kids who drop out every year, a great number of them are due to the fact that school just doesn't make any sense anymore. And the reason is because it offers them nothing because of this test. Teach to the test. Last thing I want to say is, is this, and this is a uh, comment as of, as of uh, this moment. If you go ahead and you rate your school systems based on MCAS tests, you're going to be in a situation where you're going to have an awful lot of failing school systems. Two-thirds in this state right now are underperforming. We have the number one education system in the country, top five or whatever in the world, and two-thirds of our schools are underperforming because we don't meet a matrix of tests. We have a gap achievement problem, an achievement gap problem. We have to focus on each individual kid, regardless of who, where they come from, who they are, what their uh, lineage is, and make sure that they are educated to the highest level possible. You're not going to do it by having one size fits all, banging square pegs and round holes, round pegs and square holes, and then punishing teachers when the holes don't fill one way or the other. So, I love this. I love, I love, I love going and uh, listening to debates. I love listening to people. Someone hopefully is going to get up here and say, that was a terrible thing to, to uh, denigrate MCAS. The person who gets up, though, and says that when you don't want MCAS used as a graduation requirement, you're dumbing down education. I'll go to any street corner and debate for hours. Because what that is is an insult to everybody in this room. The first thing, the first thing they throw up is, well, if you don't want a uh, standardized test, it means you don't want kids to reach the highest level. I want them to reach a higher level than a standardized test. And it seems to me that's what we should insist on. So I gotta, I gotta go. But thanks very much.
what was a good indicator of how they were going to do when they got out of high school, right? And a lengthy discussion of this. So and there's a lot of truth to the idea that MPAS and other state tests uh, are not uh, as useful as they have been portrayed, let's say. So when No Child Left Behind came in, the idea was that everybody was going to be tested, so we could find out where everybody was. And just knowing that was going to spur people into helping their kids. They hadn't really been doing everything that they could before. Now they were going to have to uh, you know, help those kids learn more. And there was going to be this dramatic research. So here is, these are national scores on a, a test called the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Um, it's the only national achievement test that's given to random samples of kids, so it actually sort of represents something. What it represents is how well kids do on tests. It doesn't say how well you're going to do in life, but at least it says how well you're going to do on, on a, a standardized test. These are the 17-year-old reading scores, and I left out the years that these tests were given. So can anybody figure out where is the point that the dramatic improvement begins? <coughs> Yeah. In the 60s? But oh, we're on the chart. Where is the 60s on this chart? So I do have the years in my next one. So these, these scores end up only back in 1970. So if you were right, you would know from this. This program started in 1970. But no child left behind effect here. Right? And so you could do other subjects and you could do other grades. All these different you know curves would have somewhat different shapes, but I don't think anybody would guess without knowing where was 2002 when No Child Left Behind started. I don't think anybody would guess where that would you know, where you would see in that movie because I believe that the, the change of increases in math scores is more or less level in our reading scores. There are no dramatic changes in this whole period of the last four years. Last November, the State uh, Board of Elementary and Secondary Education decided uh, to, to give uh, the park test a two-year test drive. They were just going to do it. They had a lot of pushback. So now they decided we will try it for two years. And uh, uh, so PAR was developed by a consortium of states with $186 million from the federal government um, in order to get race to the top funding. Excuse me, you have to agree to take part in a consortium. There's another big consortium of states. And you have to do some other things. And so that's why everybody signed on to something, for one of those consortiums. <coughs> and it's supposed to reflect Common Core, but actually the state website says that MCAS also reflects Common Core. So if you hear the idea we must go to park because we've got Common Core, the state actually, although the state officials say that, their website says something different. Um, and this is what the park test looked like. So there is a, in March, I'm going to start with the required test. Those are the ones that you have. In March, they just field tested this one. It's called performance-based assessment. Actually, if you look at the questions, what they are is open response. Right? They're somewhat similar to the MCAS open response questions. And so they are not computer scorable. And I think that's probably why they're doing them in March, because that gives some time before the end of the year to get them scored. Then at the end of the year, there's computer scorable tests. There's also supposed to be a speaking and listening assessment, but that is local. It doesn't affect your, your, your uh, statewide score, so I don't think it's going very much about it. And then there are diagnostic tests, and more, you get more tests that you can take, but those are optional. So that's the structure of it. One big difference between MCAS and PARC is how many tests. MCAS has, there's also a science test. The science test will continue regardless. So there's math and there's English language for 
3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 10, right? But in park, there are two testing seasons, the performance-based season that starts in March and the end of the year that starts in May, I think. Um, so, and also the two subjects. So that makes four, right, testing, sort of testing seasons and two additional grades, nine and <coughs> 11, right? So there's quite a bit more testing in part. So it means, for example, some teachers say they're going to save their most creative lessons for after the exam. You've got a little bit of time after the exam to do something <laughs> fun and interesting and after the exam. Right? But now there will not be any time after the exam because after the exam is summer vacation. Two other big differences. MCAS is not timed. Uh, park will be timed. So exactly how many kids will run out of time is not so clear. Kids with, with um, uh, headphones, kids with uh, disabilities, will be able to get more time, but other kids um, will be limited. And then the other huge difference is that they are uh, given on computers. So, which means some people have to pay for you know, all the upgrades that that thing. So they are offering people that there may be a, a state bond, there will be ways to pay for some of it. Um, whether that's going to pay for all of it, it seems doubtful. Especially whether, if it does pay for all of it, whether that money will not de facto come out of a third payments because they don't pay taxes because they're doing a lot of money. Um, I'm not going to go into sample items in order to save time, but uh, they're well worth looking at. Um, I think they're too interesting. I, personally, I don't think it's a bad test. I think the problem with the test is the pressure on it. That what you do with the test. Otherwise, some of these questions are pretty interesting. Some of them are ambiguous. Some of them you might hate. But all in all, that standardized test, you know, it's not particularly bad. If you Google park computer sample items, you will immediately see the sample tests for uh, three age spans that park has put online. And I recommend them. You might also want to watch um, a video of a nine-year-old girl uh, trying to take um, a, a nap. I, I think she only actually does one question uh, on an iPad. So part of her vision, the math is not a problem for her. The entire problem is dealing with the computer. Partly because she's doing it on an iPad. It would probably have been easier for her, you know, on a laptop. <coughs> But I understand that a lot of people are, a lot of kids, are going to be taking it off on the iPad. So what they, it's a seven minute take. Actually, if you watch three or four minutes, you've got the idea. And it's well worth doing. And you can find it by doing what's struggling with art. Easy to remember. So here's the schedule. They're field testing the test now, right? So what that means is there are no scores for kids. They're checking each item. How many, kid got, how many kids got each item right? This is part of developing any test. And they're also checking their ideas about how much infrastructure you need, how much computer bandwidth you need. That's happening now. One round has happened already. There'll be another round in May. Next year, and this is really important, because of all the pushbacks, pushback on part, they uh, agreed to let districts make the decision. It means the back to school committee needs to make a decision as to whether to go to PARC or stick with MCATS. And in order to make PARC more appetizing, I think they are probably not going to do the grade 9 and 11 tests. And they have told people that they won't punish you if your kids do bad in the park. They will hold you harmless. So, okay, so that's the first decision point, district by district. And then, so that's for next year, right? So it's a real test, everybody will take it, but there will be no punishments. Um, the 10th graders will continue to take the MCAS as their diploma test. After the kids take it, the following summer, they're going to decide the cut scores. What, what, what score do you need to be proficient? What step score do you need to be, you know, needs improvement? And then the following <coughs> fall, the state board will make a decision one way or another. <coughs> Even if they decide to go with PARC, they will um, keep 
passed just for the 10th graders. I think because they don't all have a great list. If they give part to 10th graders, all of a sudden, kids are missing out on their diploma. So they're you know, easing that in. But the penalties for schools and for teachers come much faster. And the class of, in 2016 and 17 would be the first class of 10th graders who might have to pass part of the diploma. But that decision hasn't been made. So there's been one round of field testing. And there's a very interesting article in the world. I think they played it pretty straight. Um, it's had some problems. No big deal. Um, mostly because there was nothing at stake. Right? So at one point, all the screens had error messages. Well, if that had counted, people would have been out of panic, right? But since it didn't count, they relaxed. And somebody came along and eventually fixed it. Right? And then there were other glitches. Or kids didn't finish. It wasn't that big a deal. It was kind of interesting. This is what we're learning, right? But when there's pressure on it, when your school's existence depends on it, and the computer screws up, right? Imagine, you know, this has happened in other states where they go to computers for real, and the, there's not enough bandwidth, and uh, kids don't know whether the computer has accepted their answer or not, and kids are in tears, and they have had to reschedule this. Major trend. We hope that isn't going to happen here. But it's very interesting at the end of the article because they're talking about how much money it's going to cost to buy more computers. And so this assistant superintendent says, So, do we ramp up technology to the test? Do we require more than that? No, these are the questions we're waiting for. So, in other words, let's see, what are we going to do with our budget? Are we going to do something that helps the test? Or are we going to do something that helps the kids? Gee, we're not very sure. <laughs> Did somebody have heard something? A question? Yeah. So the local um, school board will have control. They have control next year. But after that, it's up to the state. That's right. But I must say, superintendents and school committees made a difference already. Without having absolute control, they made it be this test drive. Otherwise, if you look at the National Park site it, the website, it says everybody's doing this next year. Period. No choices. Right? So I don't think that these people are completely impervious to pressure. The, Depart the Board of Education is a political being, right? Even though they were appointed, these are political decisions that are getting made. And so political pressure can make a difference. Next we have Ruth Rodriguez. So I'm here to share with you what has been the effect of Massachusetts Ed Reform on Latino students and English language learners. And I'd like to open up by quoting the term of the time. Um, If you don't understand the journey of those you serve, you cannot be an effective advocate. I remember in 1971 when Massachusetts first passed the bilingual, uh, Chapter 71 and bilingual law. The beauty of that law included the part where parental involvement and as a result, Massachusetts, during the 70s, began to see an improvement in the way that English language learners were being taught. Unfortunately, during the, uh, the beginning of every form, I don't know how many of you remember, 
One of the first things that Ed reform did was take away that parental role of Chapter 7 of the mind. They had the, um, the committee, the, the citywide pact, and so but his parents were lost in that. And that was key, and I say that because I worked in Worcester, Massachusetts, and I was the first family community organ, um, um, family community advocate. And I remember how willing our Latino parents, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, and Worcester, were to get involved in the children's education. As you know, it's, it's a well-known fact that we are always being told and you know, those that the parents, they don't care about education, they never come to school, they never come to, you know, school night. And, and so for me, that, that was a challenge, because I wanted to prove that, that that's not true. The reality is that the cultural difference between most uh, Latin Americans and I'm from the Dominican Republic, education is not the same as, as here. Parents, families in my country, Dominican Republic, they see school as you know the professional, and what they do is that they very much tell the children, the school, that's the second home. Teachers are to be respected. They don't have the the, the um, they're not used to going to you know. Um, school meetings and, and, and parent, you know, teacher conferences. But what I did as a parent advocate, when I spoke to many of my parents, I would say, in this country, you have to do it. Because in America, the way that parents are involved in their children's education is how they're going to be treated. So you need to be involved and to, and to see what's going on in your children's education. Which brings me to the Ed Reform. Let me tell you, they have been able to to do all this abuse on our children in school because many they they counted on a lot of these parents not questioning, not standing up. And so what I again what I say to, to parents that I work with, I say you need to be involved in your children's education. This is, has been a very well orchestrated education reform by corporate America. And what has happened is that the community has lost its power, has lost the ability to decide what's going to happen in our school. And so it, it's been taken away from us. And we all know that the heart of a democracy is, you know, an educated citizen. I don't know how many of you um, remember uh, Pablo Freire in, in Brazil, who was in prison because he promoted education for liberation. And this is what our children are being denied today with this corporate education reform where they are being um, it's a robotic uh, teaching instrument that teaches who have whose profession counts on, you know, um, they, they've been trained to teach. That has been taken away from. And we are losing wonderful teachers. Now, one of the we could say that education reform in Massachusetts, with an emphasis on high state standardized testing, school closing, and charter conversion has had a profound negative effect on a large scale of number of students. But one of the most outstanding effects has been the hardship on its Latino population, especially on English language learners. This was compounded by the most bigoted referendum that was passed in 2002, the English Immersion Honest Initiative. I don't know how many of you remember when uh, Mitt Romney was running for governor, he made that his, his whole mission to eliminate bilingual education. 
And as we have seen since then, English language learners have been denied an equal opportunity in education. This fact led me, I, I served on, on Governor Bill Patrick's readiness project of NCAS in, in assessment. So this fact led me to have a face-to-face -face conversation with Governor Val Patrick. When I challenged him, I know that the, the mayor mentioned uh, something to this major. I challenged him to immerse himself for one year in Spanish and then take the NCAS in Spanish. Because, as I said, Governor, that's what you are asking our language, English language learners to do. Now, according to the research by the Gaston Institute at UMass in Boston, the achievement gap is evident when looking at the distribution across NCAS performance level. More than one in four Latino students in grade four received a warning in two or nine on the NCAS level, compared to one in 10 white students. The majority of white students scored a profession on, or higher compared to only one in four Latino students, nearly half of whom scored at the needs improvement level. Now, let's be honest. Can you compare students, let's say, Newton and Wellesley, taking the same test that a student that just came from, from a, a non-English speaking country, that student is immersed for one year and is taking the same test that a student that has gone through the, through the whole process of, of education in this country. Do you think that's fair to compare? It's, it's like having a, uh, a runner, you know, a great runner, compete and then tie their feet and, and then say, you know, this is, it's, it's not equal. And we know that. And it's unfair. And how many English language learners have been denied a graduation um, diploma because they didn't pass the MCAS? The research also further um, expand on the issue of poverty. This has never been something that the uh, privatizers want, want to acknowledge. At a meeting that we had with um, Senator Elizabeth Warren, she was concerned about the, um, she wanted to understand about accountability. And so I said to her, well, you know, uh, Senator, that's wonderful that, you know, that they, they are concerned about accountability. But the one accountability that those who are privatizing our school don't want to admit is the fact that poverty does have an effect. A child that comes to school hungry, a child that hasn't had, you know, health service, who's with, he you know, hearing and, and the vision, cannot perform the same as a child that has all these wonderful things, you know, that every child should have. So this pattern is also very observable when ELO students are desegregated by grade. You cannot compare one with the other. Um, so where do we go from here in terms of bringing equality? A good friend of mine um, believes that this is the worst war that is being fought in, on American soil. Because it's a war against our children. Our children are the ones who are being left behind. And for what? If we look at the whole concept of, of this obsession with, with high safe testing, the ones who are really benefiting are the testing industry. You can Google Pearson and all those testing industry and see how much of a profit they have made in the last 10, 10 years since the session of high state testing. At, at the expense of taking resources away from the most needy schools. And so remember, without the high state testing and without the charter school and, and closing our school, they cannot make a profit. So this is something that, unfortunately, we are faced with a bigger challenge because this 
whole corporate agenda has endured, you know, the favor of both parties, what we see today. We have our president who goes around saying that he does not believe that teachers and students should spend a whole year prepping for a single test. But what does he do? He allows his Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, to do exactly the opposite. So we are, we have, you know, uh, a challenge of Marisa, and we really need to organize ourselves. Our families need to come together and realize that they have a right to protect their children. And for me, English language learners is something that I am working hard to inform them of their rights because under the Constitution, you as a parent have a right to say, I do not want my child to be subjected to this abuse. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Juan Rosa of the Caribbean uh, Studies Institute. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to tell you, uh, I was going to be planning to speak today um, because uh, we have so many distinguished panelists here, folks who have written about this stuff enormously. Uh, but I am. Uh, there is particular motivation in me coming down. Now I know as I look across the audience, I see, I see a lot of people who were my students, some folks who were my students, and these people who are looking for more of this discussion and talking about for a while. But I'm not. This is a, uh, a five minute thing that I want to chat with you about. And the reason I want to chat with you about it is because it's intensely personal for me. Uh, I got to tell you that I'm in awe. I am in awe of students who stand up and are honest about the fact that they will be doing this. Students, I mean, think about that. It's sort of the conformity pressure the students have for the student to stand up and say, look, I don't believe in this thing. This thing does not define me. I'm in awe of somebody like that. Someone has that much courage. Now, likewise, some families you know, have taken on this battle knowing full well that they take on the full pressure of the state. And there's something about that. There's something about the courage that it takes to do something like that that we should admire. You know, these panelists, distinguished folks come on up here and talking. Mayor Scott Lang, you know, said something that was interesting that, that we need to focus on each individual kid. We need to focus on each individual kid. Now, Henry David Thoreau has this beautiful quote that he says that if a man marches to the beat of his own drum, uh, if a man march, marches to a different drum, perhaps it is because he hears a different drum and he doesn't step to the music, however measure how far away. Right? In my understanding, this is what education is supposed to be. It's supposed to be about awakening curiosity in kids. Right? But we are fundamentally dishonest. The same way that Kurosawa says that human beings are fundamentally incapable of being honest with themselves and about themselves. We're lying. As teachers, we're lying. As administrators, we're lying. Because we know that this stuff does not do what we claim that it does. And teachers know this. Teachers know this fully well. Some of you in here know this. You understand this. Now this is what bottles the imagination, right? You understand this, you feel it down to the core of your being, but you walk inside this classroom and you try to convince this child that this child should take this test and put all this pressure on top of this child. And then my daughter comes home all depressed. But you put it on because the pressure is put on top of you. But the administrator also knows this thing. We're complicit in this lie. And who pays for it? The kids pay for it. So we have no problem paying $10,000 a year to educate children, but paying $100,000 to incarcerate them a year. We don't have any issues with this thing. Now, uh, I'm very fond of using Frederick Douglass quote, quotes. You know, there's a beautiful quote that says that, uh, a little education is a dangerous thing. 
but the want of education is a calamity to any people. Look, the fact of the matter is we're doing to these kids exactly what the system is imposing on the kids. It's a calamity to any people. Because you don't really want an educated citizen. The system doesn't want an educated citizen. You do not want the child who's going to question why is it that there's a, there's a desert in New York City that costs $25,000 when people are sleeping homelessly. You don't want that child. You don't want the child to ask why is it that we can't deal with Cuba, this little tiny country over here, but we can deal with China because Cuba is a communist. Give them that defense status. You don't want that citizen. Now this is where it's personal for me. You see, these tests, inevitably what they do is they structure the zero tolerance policies that gets the kids forced out of school. The kids don't drop out, they're forced out. The big problem is that I get to go to the funeral. The city of 100,000 people with a homicide being higher than Washington, D.C., for me, that's a problem. It's a problem that I know so many who have been killed because they're outside of school because of policies like this. That's a problem for me. They're not faces that I don't know, they're families that I know, they're kids that I know. Yeah, we go back to school on Monday morning and we engage in this complicit lie. And we don't want to talk about it. What kind of citizen do you want? You take one city that's doing extremely well in standardized tests, and you measure that city against New Bedford. You measure that city against Colorado. You forget that you're setting up systems inside that city that take those kids that you think are going to be problems in the MCAS test and brought them to alternative means of education. And then you're telling me this system is here. No, if you actually count all the kids, the system's not there. But you're pitting that system against this system. This is the personal stuff about it. This is the personal thing about it. Because it's not just policy. It's policy that ends up with children that I know in jail or in the same jail. And it's got to be talked about. It's got to be talked about. Sorry to be sitting down.
They're not conducive to creating equity inside our schools. They're not conducive to citizens and have people putting in a fair chance of succeeding in our society. And he just pointed that out clearly, the inequities that occur. Now, when we think of inequity in America, that's part of the fabric. That's part of the economic fabric. This is a country that was founded upon exploitation, genocide, inequity, all these terrible things. And unfortunately, a lot hasn't changed. Um, we still have an economic system that depends on the class system and depends on racism. However, on the individual level, when we're in our own communities, we can begin to try and chip away at that, slowly but surely. And I advocate that one way is opting out of the standardized tests that currently have been implemented via federal and state mandate. When I first began to think about opting my own child out, I was, of course, provoked by the situation in which I encountered on my job. I had been teaching at a fairly high-performing school. It was a magnet program. It was a wonderful school. I mean, the best of what you can have in terms of everything when you're talking about a teacher and a teaching environment. The students were diverse ethnically, racially. You also had a diversity in income level. But they were all there together. The teachers were all there together we were producing what we call quality education. Um, during that time, I can remember students coming back to visit the school and sharing with me that college is a piece of cake. You guys really prepared us for college. And it wasn't a challenge. It wasn't as difficult for them. That narrative changed within the last, I say, 12 or 13 years. It's now a challenge and it's not so easy. The literacy, literacy skills that are necessary for success have been challenged for many students, and not all students, but for a lot more than ever before. Um, I was teaching at a school, the same school, unfortunately, that Trayvon Martin attended. Um, the school was, again, performing well. Um, I was asked to leave that school and go teach at a school that was considered local county. And when I went into the local county school, I was shocked. I was dismayed. Um, in fact, there were days I went home and cried. I couldn't believe what was going on. I couldn't believe the inequity. I couldn't believe it was America in 2009. Um, I thought I had walked back in history to a time before Brown. Um, I couldn't believe that the students, it was a predominantly African-American school, the teaching staff was predominantly African-American, but there were problems. And I couldn't understand why they were persisting in this particular school, and I began to understand who was creating the problems more so than anyone else. And it began to be apparent to me that it was the system. And it was this system of high-stakes testing that was being implemented and used to actually assess the quality of the school, to assess the ability of students, and to assess the quality of teachers. Um, the school was under sanction. And in Florida, under sanction means you have very strict curriculum. It means that there's no field um, trips, no outside activities for students during the course of the school day. It means students are stuck in language arts and math courses um, for most of the day, and electives are sublimated. It means the students have to do what they're told as well as the educators within the, in the building. The principals have no autonomy, the teachers have no autonomy. It's sad too because during that, when you have people that came inside the building to evaluate if all these scripted things and forced mandates were being implemented, they tended to be teams of white people that were coming into black schools and that were ostracizing black educators in front of black children. Um, and this would happen regularly, at least once a month. More than not, you would see teachers in their classrooms crying real tears after they were ostracized in front of their students by these teens of white people. Me being me. <laughs> okay. I begin to say, okay, you know, we got to rally the forces here. We got to do some nation building. It's time to revolt. And so, anyway. With the scripted curricula, since I was there to build literacy and serve as a uh, reading coach and a mentor, I said, we're not going to deal with these materials that have been placed here. We're going to use rich materials that are actually going to help build literacy as opposed to keeping the children dumb. 
because it became apparent to me there's a conscious decision here to make sure these kids are not educated well. There's a conscious decision here to make sure they can't perform on not just the high stakes test mandated by the state, but they're not going to do well within the context of their classroom and within the context of, of any college assessments as well. So I organized the forces. We, we overthrew the scripted curriculum. We made some success in terms of building literacy in the school. However, those of us that rebelled were dropped, kicked out of the school shortly thereafter and replaced with te Teach for America teachers. And I don't know if the TFA phenomenon has come here in the vast proportions that it has in the state of Florida, but now the school is filled with teachers that are, are, are not well versed in pedagogy. They have hard times managing classrooms. They're transient, of course, they're only there for a couple years. And even though the school is rated an A school now, you still have the difficulty with these kids getting into colleges and universities. They're having trouble still with literacy outside of the school. Um, there are still problems. And that is a major concern. So anyway, as I was dealing with all these situations, I found other people that from around the country that understood what was going on on the same level of my understanding. And that's how I originally became a part of Save Our Schools. Out of that Save Our Schools March on Washington, there were a core group of us that decided that we were going to tackle this educate, this market-based reform on the level of the assessments themselves. And so we said we were going to form a group and we get to opt out of testing. Now, when I came home from that first March on Washington, I sat down and I talked to my husband. He's a football coach. He had been teaching in those sanctioned schools long before I had. Um, and would come home and complain, and I, I could only listen to him, but not really understand what he was going to until I entered one myself. But we sat down, we talked with our daughter, and this is when she was in ninth grade, and we said, we're not going to have her sit for the assessments anymore. I said, I've been talking to some people, and I think we just need to opt out of the testing. I mean, we're, why should we continue to support the system that is so oppressive and so racist? and so exclusive because really, in actuality, is setting our children that are brown and black, our children that have special needs, our children that are second language, and it's even moving into our suburban white moms, as Audrey Duncan calls it, and compromising their curricular offerings as well, and compromising their school year by all this emphasis on teaching to the test. And so when I first submitted the letter, of course I got pushed back. And the pushback came in the form of, you can't do that. And my response, yes, I can do that, and I'm going to, and you're not going to stop me. And they tried to get my daughter apart from the inside the school building and sit her down and say, Aisha, this is your mom and dad doing this. What do you really want to do? And Aisha said, I want to opt out. And they said, well, Aisha, why do you want to opt out? And she goes, because the tests are racist. And at that point, they left her alone. <laughs> and so anyway to make a long story short she went through the rest of her high school years each year they would offer her the opportunity one year in particular the um lead principal was replaced with another principal and she was going to take me on to the tub your child's going to take this test. So we hit a year in there where they would constantly stand over Asia outside the classroom, go in and try and get her to report to a test site to take what they call in Florida the retakes for students that didn't pass the test in, in 10th grade. And so it got to the point where I instructed Asia, if they continue to hoover over you and try and intimidate you to report to a test site, Simply tell them that you have your phone, you will pull it out, you will report them to the police that they are committing assault and you want to file charges. When she told them that, we had no problems whatsoever once again. So my point in sharing this narrative is that those of you that are considering it, it can be done. Um, when I met with the five other people that were a part that formed our group, United Dost Out National. Um, the first thing that we did, we came up with a game plan. This is how we're going to do this. We said, we'll create a website. So we created the website, and the first thing that was on the website was 
where Peggy Robertson, who is in Colorado, interviewed me and asked me about my experience in opting out. Well, we posted it on the website. We started inviting people to join our Facebook page and our visit our website. And each year we grew from there to the point where we became the major resource where people could, could, get, their, could get their state by state guide on opting out. Um, we have several, well, several actions thus far annually during the spring. Two of them were in front of the Department of Education and we had the Who's Who in academia that represented Who's Who and, and activists for, for quality public education. Um, and we decided this year, this past spring, to take it to Colorado. And in Colorado, we set up workshops to train people which were, were coming to Massachusetts. So be ready for us. We're, we're going to Florida and Massachusetts next. But we set up workshops to actually train people how to, to start the you know, opt-out movement in their own communities. Um, in doing so, Peggy, one of the co-founders and co-administrators, was interviewed by a Colorado um, media outlet. It was the Fox News for, for that local area. And they asked her what was the purpose, and she said, well, we're going to take down market-based reform. The very next day, we tried to get into our opt-out website, and it was totally destroyed. It was hacked, it was sabotaged. So right now, we're rebuilding the website, but Anyone that wants to get their opt-out guide, their state opt-out guide, that is available for them on the Facebook page, on your files, on our page where you can click on files and you can still get your, your um, opt-out guide. But it's a movement that needs to grow. Common Core has been implemented um, in New York with its, its, its pilot testing last year, and they're facing the actual testing this year. Good news. Over 35,000 parents opted their children out of the faith testing in just two to three rural bureaus alone. Um, we're not talking about the whole state of New York, we're talking about right here in New York City. And so the movement is growing. It's growing in many states. In Florida, we have a school board member named Rick Roach, who is um, Orange County, which is in Central Florida. Rick Roach decided to not only look at the test, he decided to take the test. So he took the math assessment, he took the reading assessment. Now Rick has several master's degrees. He has been a school board member for many, many years. Um, he has to make complex budgetary decisions. He has to read complex documents. He failed both sections of the test. Well, maybe Rick had a problem. So eight mothers decided they were going to take the test. These eight women took the test. We have uh, a woman who's passed the bar exam. She's an attorney. We had a woman that was a marketing executive. Um, most of the women that took it were professional, and none of them passed both sections of the test. We had a few that passed the, the math section. Um, reading was a challenge for everyone. <coughs> so when we look at that, we start asking, what are we asking our kids to do? And in asking them to do this, why are we asking them to do things that we can't even do as adults? These people that are creating the legislative policies that are mandating this, if most of them sat down to take these assessments, they would not pass them either. Um, they would not pass them at any better rates than, than our students pass them. And clearly, clearly we can see that the tests are biased towards social or economic groups. We can see the tests are basically being used to, as a part of, to me, the global effort to redistribute wealth in this world, really. And because of that, we need to be cognizant of what we are doing overall to our children. I've been teaching for 25 years, and I can see the cognitive differences in children now in contrast to those when I first started teaching. Um, we have children that don't like to go deep now. They don't like to think de deeply. They, I always tease my students in saying that um, I'm the baby boomer generation. There's the millennials, there's X, there's Y, but you guys are the standards because everything they do is almost like a standard response. Um, instead of thinking on their own, they'd rather take this side of the room has one answer and everybody's name is on a different table with the same answer. They'd rather cheat. They'd rather 
not stretch their imaginations, the creative abilities of students have been deeply compromised. Um, you can see the difference in what's happening with our kids. And they're far too ready just to go along with the crowd as opposed to questioning, as your mayor pointed out earlier. So it's important that we do begin to establish opt-out communities in our country. Um, and I think Massachusetts, Rhode Island, this area right now is prime to go ahead and start that ball rolling here in this community. There's also a film that I think needs to be shown in this community if it hasn't already. I'm not sure the standardized been shown. It's reading at uh, April. Okay, that's a film that that we need to get as many community members out as we can. The other piece is we need to start getting brown and black parents involved in the Alton community. Um, as Rufus said, the second language issues, you have immigration issues, a lot of our, our, our second language parents may not be documented, may not have children that are documented, but they need to understand that push to the forefront should be those in their community that are, and they need to be able to carry the rest of the community along. And I think as we begin to continue to set up the, the workshops and the um, <coughs> conferences, in various different communities across this nation, we can get the ball rolling and get everybody included in fighting this horrible monster. Um, equity in America is a hard task. Um, it will take a sea change of economic policy. It will take a sea change, but we need to be able to educate children so they can create that sea change, way by way. And I think if we work together and start organizing on the local level, and start implementing direct actions and involved opting out, we can get it done. Um, that's all about all I need to share. Thank you, Sarasta Smith. Uh, Sarasta mentioned the relationship between high stakes testing and racism. Uh, of course, any structure that we, we have coming <coughs> from other countries. Um, taking a test a year after being here, and many of them are being pushed out, and the effects right, will, be, will be racist in, 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 in sort of that scenario. But the high stakes testing also has a historical root. Um, it's, it's, it comes from the work of uh, Alfred Binet um, and his whole experience with IQ testing. Now, Alfred Binet was interested in using it for these purposes that, that it's being used today. Uh, from Alfred Binet, it sort of morphs, it's easy to correct me if I'm wrong here, but it morphs into the work of Lewis Terman, um, who actually developed the SAT, and Lewis Terman was actually a genesis. Right? He believed that black people were inherently inferior to white people. Um, and Lewis Terman wasn't the only one. I mean, Edda Hollingworth, uh, which is a person that, if you, if you teach gifted education, and you have a manual on gifted education, if you open it, she's still cited. Um, her work, dates back to the um, mid-1900s, and she was also in Genesis, right? uh, the, the founder of gifted education. Right? So a lot of this stuff actually has, uh, can be traced. You know, it's not just, you know, uh, I mean, just saying that something is racist, right, uh, is, is, is very frontal, and it could, be, um, it could be sort of a statement that shocks people and turns people off. But the reality is that if you look at its history, right, it is what it is. 